So I want to thank you. I want to. I, I was just looking around, going, "Well, the school has changed tremendously." You know, well, yeah, there's many changes. I'm like, was this there? Was that there? Was that street there? Was that building there? So I guess the energy of the place is continuing. And yet I still see the folks, you know, without houses still, you know, on the street. And uh, that hasn't changed uh, at all. If it not, it's gotten worse over this last, my visits back to Oakland. So I want to I wanna thank you. I want to start with, um, I wanted to think about today. Um, I have, I brought my, my, you know, flash drive to show you work. This is an art school. I should show you work. But I, you know, the other day, one of my students asked me to show my work because I'm teaching. I never talk about my work when I'm teaching. I always feel like I'm, it's like your professors that make you read their books, right? <laughs> it kind of makes you feel like you're being held hostage to ideas. I don't know. I used to say maybe that's what it was. But the other day when, when Juan asked me to show my work, I realized that I had been through a very impactful experience. And I was, uh, uh, and it me dio susto, you know, like it scared me. It kind of scared me out of my body almost. And having then to respond to it, you know, um, has kind of made me realize that there are a couple things in my art making time, you know, that, that changed the way I came to it. And, uh, and so I, it, it is still about, you know, what we feel as, um, you know, what is, what is important about what we do. Those are the questions that I had to ask myself because somehow, you know, I was motivated to make work. So it's how it wasn't like anybody said to me, this is what you're supposed to do. I just understood that that's what I was supposed to do. That there were two things that were set out for me since about, I was about nine years old. One of it was that I would make art. And I felt that it was such a personal, very, uh, intimate experience. And the second thought that came to me was, well, then what will you do in the world? What will you do in the world? Because if it's such a personal thing to you, then what point is it that you belong to the world and respond to the world and be of service to the world? And so I thought I would teach. It was so immediate that the teaching and the making art, you know, was combined. And so when the invitation come, came to go to Santa Barbara, I can't, we both came and we said our task was not, you know, anything other than to hold this <laughs> little ball of light. <laughs> That's how I introduced it to our chancellor and the deans and everybody. Just look at it as a ball of light. It has no shape. You know, it's all possibility. We don't even know um, what will happen until we start our work, until we are here for a minute and we start to meet the people that maybe want to work with us and maybe see a need for us. And if that doesn't happen, then we'll leave. Because I didn't really feel like I needed to, you know, push or pull anything anymore. I do want to say that, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of, um, when I, when Betty Aureni asked me to, to uh, speak to, responsibility. What is our responsibility? And she dedicated this to the waters. And I thought, well, geez, that's so simple, right? Our responsibility is to be, you know, first of all, whole. Our responsibility is to be in our bodies. Our responsibility is that it's so simple, right? You've been hearing this a lot. You know, we use, have all this terminology like self-care, which I don't like, by the way. <laughs> self-care. It's, it's just a clunky word, so unpoetic. But it does have a truth in it. And it's something that my mom and my, and my grandmother used to always say to me, you know, and, and observe, you know, that I come from very hardworking people. There's great pride in the ability to labor, you know, to go from day to night. You know, my mom had three jobs, four jobs, I don't know as many as she could have through all the time of raising me, which gave me the opportunity to do what I do. And so my loyalty lays with her, but I couldn't hear her. I, I, as everything she said to me about my work at the time, my interests, everything, she would always tell me, you know, that I was just so in the world. And when was I gonna come home? And I didn't realize her isolation. 
I didn't realize what it meant for her to leave her home in the, at her, at, in, the, in her age of 40, my grandmother, to come to a whole new place without being able to speak the language and take up a life. And education, you know, was the process that I was supposed to go through. And a process that, that changed the culture of our home. I lived in this culture and she lived in another and the two of us had a hard time meeting. And she didn't understand the culture of school. And it was so difficult for her, you know, to, to see me reading and not think of it as a waste of time. So she would say to me, the more you read, the less, the less you understand. And so I, I, I felt like I was up against it all the time, trying to make the space, right, to, to do what I was compelled to do. And I thought at that time, as a, as a kid, that this is what I was intending to do and it was up against opposition. And that state of mind and opposition then kind of led me through many, many ways in which I never quite was able to occupy the whole of it. Because it was, it was an opposition that I went to school. It was an opposition that I wanted to teach. The teachers of the day always said to me, why do you want to make art? Why do you want to be an artist? It's the hardest thing you could do. Why don't you be a social worker? Like social work was somehow easier than making art. And, that, and I kept hearing that maybe I wasn't supposed to make art. Maybe I didn't have what it takes to make art. And so people were trying to kindly take me to the place where at least I'd be of service to my community. And so I kept saying, you know, the social workers and my grandmother in my life were not nice people. They were not helpful to us. We've had to raise our social workers with social consciousness and understanding for them to be of service to us. They've had to come from within our community to have the ability to see us. And we've had to teach them what it means you know, to be in communities and to see not everybody as someone you're going to serve, but as a source of something that you don't know. And that's been the process then of, you know, of, uh, of my work. It started as a kid looking for that something in opposition, looking through the something through silences, the silence of opposition, the, the silence of, of, not, of not being um, able to speak through the traumas that drove my family here. And that's what I was looking for and looking for that source and looking for the source that I inherited was what started me off in art making. I didn't know it then, it had no name. I didn't know how to think of myself. I just kept going forward. And so when I was asked to speak about responsibility, I said, the only thing I could think of, you know, that has been true for me is, you know, to, The, to do the, the practice of self-determination, to put it in that kind of language, to actually be in practice of the search. That's why when we had the idea for the center, uh, I wanted it to be such a long name. <laughs> Las Maestro Center for Chicana, Indigenous Thought, Art and Social Practice. Because it was so unallowed. It is unallowed to this day. There is controversy, complexity. We are allowed to be Latinos. We're allowed to be Hispanics. We're allowed to, we're allowed to basically identify with the nation state. But we are not allowed to call ourselves by our own name. And since the moment that I began making art, people told me, painting's dead. People told me, Chicano oh, was a flash in the pan between 1964 and 1974, and too bad you missed it. Each moment that I, um, you know, each moment, each step forward was in opposition to something that was, to me, quite alive. And so I, I remember thinking that if the museums had collected all my bones and had written about them and documented them and had you know, displayed them and had written an enormous amount of books on them, I decided that these are my bones. 
who better knows the bone than I myself? And I refuse to read about my bones in someone else's book, although I respect the work and I do refer to it. But I had to find a way to get back to my own bones to understand what it was that was driving me forward in this, in this world. So I talk about this world and I talk about the world of my grandmother, the world of our home, and how quickly I went running out of it, looking for that something that I couldn't see. And it's taken a long time to realize that it was one whole circle, that the me that ran out is the me that returns. And so the responsibility was the practice then, because that is what has, what has uh, moved me and led me and helped me understand the practice, the making. So I know it sounds like what, you know, is our response? It's huge. You ask yourself, what is your responsibility? Who are you responsible to and for? And as you answer those questions, I, it comes down to one thing, really, sustainability. This is what we've been fighting for, sustainability. Not the, not the um, you know, uh, what it is that we can hold, what it is that doesn't occupy and entrench and exploit and extract. This is what we've been dealing with on this continent. It's the trauma and the energy of this continent that everything is up for grabs all the time. And yet at the same time, we have to be able to touch, hold, do, make. So I feel at this moment that I am under the stress of, you know, of censorship. I feel like we are in this moment, living a time that I haven't felt since about 1969, 1968, during the war, with this great sadness hovering over as I watched my friends and my friends, my relatives go off to war and come back damaged, never to be the same again. This, this way that we walked around at that time, when I think about it, I remember the letters from my boyfriend from every single place that was being bombed in Vietnam. I think now we have the, a similar kind of experience as we experience war after war, we return from war, we go back to war, we talk about war, it, you know, we are, you know, thinking about the waters, what does it mean in the waters, what do the waters mean to us. We've been taught their natural resources and commodities, we carry them around. These are things, this relationship, the paper it's built on, the what comes inside, where it came from, those are questions that, you know, we dare not ask. So when we think about sustainability, then it's sustainability through everything that's happening around us that we have. What is the power that we have? What is the power that we have? Those are the questions that come back to me. So as a young person, I talked about rights, my rights. We fought for rights and we had to fight for rights because that was the truth of the day. The anti-colonialist movements that influenced us, that caused us then to create a movement to ask for the simple, the simplicity of it. Again, about sustainability. Those of us who've been moved and removed and moved again and removed and named and renamed, a consistent, not, it didn't happen 500 years ago. It happens every day. And we have to then deal with this every day. So this idea of sustainability, of sustaining our spirit, of being able to hold all of the movement that's happening around us and all of the pressures as to, you know, what is the market today? The responsibility then, you know, is how do you be yourself when people tell you take care of yourself? How do you accomplish that task in the midst of all it takes for us to, you know, to do this work? So what I came to was the practice of self-determination, how we name ourselves and how we perform that naming. So how do we walk in what we call ourselves? How do we reconnect to understand what it is that we do on a daily basis? Because that's what it really 
how do we get to our work? How do we keep doing our work? I think after 40 years, you know, that um, people always talk to you after 40 years, you know, come and talk to me. And if you're still making work, you know, well, <laughs> you can like be proud, you know? I don't know if that's true. I don't know. The task then is how do you not get lazy? How do you not get boring? How do you not get cynical? How do you slough off, you know, all that comes at you? So yeah, right now I, you know, suffered a censorship over, over a work I needed to make. No one asked me why. Nobody asked me what it meant. I made assumptions. And so politically, I'm always talking about assumptions. I'm saying we carry our assumptions with us. We bring them everywhere we go. We assume everything's okay, you know, and it's the dialogue that unravels the assumption. But for dialogue to happen, there has to be the ability to listen. So what is our responsibility to listen? But how do you listen if you're not in your body? How do you listen? if you're in opposition. All of those circular questions then are what has emerged for me as a, as a working artist. These are the questions that come at me all the time. How do I be in community and make my work? It's not always safe. I especially don't feel safe right now. You know, I, I think that I had, to, I had to say that because, you know, I think this is the first public talk I've done since that, since that, uh, um, uh, uh, well, I can call it an attack. I could call it lots of things, but I think maybe, maybe I'm beginning to think about it as opportunity because it is opportunity to address the issues directly. It's opportunity to face the prejudice that we as Chicanos have suffered for generations. And there is a prejudice. There is a prejudice towards the people that, you know, what, that call ourselves, whether we say Chicano or Chicana or Chicanex, it's such a mouthful that I'm wanting to call ourselves the people of the Chi. <laughs> just Chi. Because otherwise I, my mouth just, you know, has to remember to go through all of those movements. But we have suffered. And I, and I want to say my responsibility is to talk about it. My, the responsibility of a people that has a movement in their DNA. We've been moving through this continent for millennia. We've never been concerned, you know, with who the other is. We've always looked at ourselves and understood we were human beings. And we understood then that sometimes, you know, people were friendly and sometimes not. We understood. But in the, in the last iteration of 500 years, you know, of finding ourselves one, reduced to natural resource and moved for better exploitation and being unable to speak for the land that becomes natural resource that then is exploited. And so we're moved and removed and then moved again historically, continuously. It doesn't just happen a long time ago. You see the people coming now because people, life wants life. And we understand that you go to where it's bountiful and fruitful and good because you want to live. And so that movement that continues, that movement, you know, has, has been expressed and there's been a racialization of that movement and there's been a, a language for that movement. And so, you know, there's terminologies, you know, that are ugly and terminologies that are, that are limiting and terminologies that make us look at ourselves as if somehow we are not safe standing anywhere because we can't call it home. And if we can't call it home and if we can't name ourselves, then who are we? And so part of the, the responsibility I have, you know, in teaching in art schools like this is if there's no one to reflect us, how the hell can we see ourselves? And I came at a time when there was nothing to see on the wall that reflected me. 
Some of the first art makers, Irena Cervantes, Yolanda Lopez, created images that we could see ourselves reflected in. But when we are asked to make art without a history, it is part of that colonial project that tells us that there's nothing there that matters, just move on. Be part of progress, move on. And to progress, our families take that deep inside themselves and they say, we have to leave everything behind to progress. And progress means to become a wage laborer. That's progress. Stop feeding yourself, forget the miracle and the science of the milpa. Forget about feeding yourself. Forget about knowing what it means you know, to grow food, to know what it means to drink clean water and just move on and buy the water in a container and earn the wages so you can go eat the sugar you know, crop that, that the colonizer has provided for us that, you know, so we can build their wealth as we build our bodies. So these are the things that when I come to art making, I'm going, wait a minute, <laughs> California, if you look at it and do the research and look across California and see how many of me are teaching in the schools to the young people that we Hispanic serving institutions are bringing to the table. So it is the responsibility thing. When you say responsibility, it means that I got to say the unpopular things, the things that are not nice and are not pleasant and you know, and are complicated and complex. And at the same time, you know, to understand that, you know, that the practice of self-determination means that you've got to do it. There's nothing else that you can do. You can't please anybody with yourself. You can't be yourself and please everybody. Sometimes it just doesn't look good. And sometimes, you know, you have to live in what I call the not knowing. Sometimes I make things and I don't know. And sometimes I have the best intention and it doesn't work. But I need the space to do that because I've never had, we've never had that opportunity. I'm the first one in my family to get to this table. I'm the first one in the generation to get to this table. Therefore, we need the space. And if you don't know what we're talking about, then say so. That's all. The responsibility that we all have is to say what we know and what we don't know, to ask questions and to listen. As artists, right, we're, we're caused to move. We're caused to move. We're caused to think. I sometimes think that there's a poetry in it, that the politics then are poetic, that the politics that we, that we, that we create are not just about, you know, the real, you know, <laughs> bread and butter, as they say, of life. But the things that, that, that we don't always pay attention to. I was thinking, I'm so blessed to have grown up in the time I did in Sacramento, close to the Bay Area. This is like, I can't, this, the Bay Area as a young person was, I don't know, it was, it was, it was godly, sacred, they were, the energy here of all the people that came here, of all of the people that were struggling here, of all of the cultures represented, of all the struggle and the arguments, and believe me, between the Trotskyites and the Communist Party, and you know, I was there for those arguments, and you know, what was good and what was not, and all of the different ways that people work together to produce, you know. If you want a healing, I tell people, if you need medicine that you can't find anywhere, go to the Bay Area. You will find someone to help you. And there is somebody here that has that medicine. You know, that, I think that, that ability as a young person to be in this area is what allowed me to, you know, to, to know what I needed to, to, to go towards, at least. To have the faith, even if I didn't know what kind of an egg was I going to hatch you know, who was I as an art maker? It took a long time to figure it out. Actually, you know, it, when you say, you know, Benny, I always, I always say, okay, who has taught me the most? It's been the young people, the students that have, that have taught me the most. Because they tell me things I don't know. The best of them, you know, tell me, you know what, you don't know. <laughs> Let me, you got that wrong, Say you got it wrong. Let me tell you. And I'm going, what? 
Okay. Because they're the ones that allowed me to have a name. You know, just like when I was young, we were able to push because we had that energy to push and to call our, our elders and say to them, you know, this is why I could come out to my, to my community. And it's, even though they rejected me, and it still hurts, even though that we're still friends, but no one invites me home myself. <laughs> it's a painful experience, but I'm free. And, you know, I think that that's my responsibility, right? The practice of what that means. So when people get upset at me, you know, for not doing it the right way, I always say, well, you know, that prescription has never worked for any of us. We wouldn't have the work that we have now had we been doing it the right way. So I think that the including, I have a whole list here of what it means to make the work that I make. But I think that one of the most important things that has come out of responsibility for us as, as Chicanex first generation artists has been to reconnect, first of all, to our bodies, and second of all, to our homes and our families. And that has allowed us then to reconnect to our communities. And when we reconnect in our full body to our family and our community, we put our community back into history because we're always taught out of history. We don't see ourselves in history or our families. It's over there. Everyone is over there. They're there. We're here. And so when I hear my students talk about, well, yes, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm going to um, search for my roots. And I say, what? Well, right here. It's right here. A root is only alive when it has a plant. If you're talking about roots that are over there and they're not connected to you, they're not your roots. And they can only move with you and they stay alive through you and you keep them alive. That is the process of the rooting. These are all things that I feel are, are the tasks that we've had as Chicanex artists that have come to the table in the last 50 years. But I wanna say something about that. Back again to the, to the, I'm sorry, if the politic, you know, I have to keep coming back around the politics of the spirit. So 50 years ago, when I went to school, I had, I don't know, four Chicanx teachers and three Native American teachers and two African American teachers and a couple Asian teachers and, you know, some, Okay, that was because in 1968, the young people stood up and demanded an ethnic studies program and the art departments hired people. I urge you to find that because I tell my students, there's a law in California that there can only be one Latino artist per 1000 square miles. <laughs> and if you've got one in the printing department, you're not gonna hire one in sculpture. This is the truth. You can, I've never been able to assemble the education that I had in 1970. You know, amazing place, amazing place. The poets and the writers and the artists that were there. And when they moved on in their careers, nobody followed. There were no hires along the way, no adjunct and no, I mean, maybe adjunct, but there were no assistant and associates. And so when they retired and they opened up the jobs, they said, oh, well, you need at least five years teaching experience at a university. Who had it? Not us. So these are things when responsibility hits, it's about noticing those kind of things, noticing that we are present in the room and that there's issues and concerns that we have to struggle for and not be convinced then that what you bring with you does not matter, that you only look forward as if you're a shadow in the room and there's nothing behind you, just what you see in front. Because sustainability means that you pay attention to your surround, that you realize that you're part of something, not on top of something, and not meant to be over something, but a part of something that's essential. 
And if you can keep that responsibility as an art maker, I think it's, and I'm learning that from you. I feel like I can't tell you anything that you don't already know. I can only tell you my own experience and what it is that brought me to this table. I think the only thing I think about when I make art is purpose and reason. It's something that the elders taught me to do anything, that there has to be a purpose for what you do. You have to have a reason for why you do it. So when people say to me, man, why do you want to do that? Well, I have to ask myself the same question. Let me let you all go home with these last words. <laughs> A really quick story. I was telling, well, this is part of telling Bobby. Thank you, Bobby, for talking about the rat because last night at two in the morning, I was awakened by a huge, large bump in the night. I thought somebody had broken into our house. We, Sheree and I got up, she grabbed a broom, you know? I, but she, of course she got behind me, okay, with the broom. <laughs> on the door, I got the broom, I'm like. <laughs> so, you know, we go in there looking for the, whatever it was that was rattling the door, it sounded like. I mean, I didn't know it was knocking huge. It sounded huge. I was remembering the movie about the alien. Remember the, the in the baseball field, baseball bat, what was the name of that movie? I can't think of it. <laughs> Anyway, there was a scene in there where the alien is locked in the, in the, in the pantry. And I, so we're opening up the closet, you know, trying to find this. Well, it was in the wall. I suspect it was either a raccoon or a possum or a rat. But it was there and knocking and shaking and I could hear it gnawing. And I was thinking, oh my God, it's eating the electrical cord. I don't know. You know, you start imagining what's behind the wall, what's there and what's it eating and what's it wrapped up in and why doesn't it go? And I'm thinking, what am I gonna do? So I go and get my medicine, my copal, and I light it and I, I go to the one little electric plug that's right there and I start <laughs> blowing it in there. <laughs> I don't know what else to do, you know? And, uh, and, and then Cherie, you know, talks to it really nicely, very sweetly and says, you know, please, you know, this is not a good home for you. Obviously, it doesn't agree. <laughs> it's carving a home in there, I think. But then Bobby talked about Yemaya. And I thought, oh, Yemaya came to visit. And, and very, very loudly, which means that what is my responsibility? I better pay attention. COVID brought our attention, you know, to our responsibility to each other. I wanted to say this much in ending. We are and share the breath of life. Oh, oh, oh. It's the end of a prayer and the beginning of a prayer that we share the breath of life that the prayer that I love the best comes from the Lakota people, which says, we are connected through the breath of our grandfather on this grandmother. We are connected through the breath of our grandfather on this grandmother. That to me is what it is, because here we are with our masks, realizing that our breath is an important part that we can't even share without fear at this moment. And why? Because we have stirred things up that should not have been stirred up. It's not that it came from somewhere else. It came from right here. It came from our behavior as human beings. Each and every one of us share that responsibility as human beings. And now we have to contend with what we've created because we can say that about a lot of things, right? In our environment, but it is, you know, something to understand that our people, I say, this is not news. I am standing here. I think the, the daughter of the 5% of the survivors on this continent through the breath that came off those boats and infected millions of people. 
And we are the survivors of that. My responsibility is remembering that. And how did we survive? We did not survive, you know, by, by pointing fingers at each other. You did it, you did it. We survived because we figured out that unless we organized ourselves and figured out what was wrong and figured out a most simple response, which when the Spanish came back again, after that first trip and where they infected everybody, people were not living close to each other. They were living on opposite sides of their plantings. There was a reason for that. <laughs> Simple. The, the, the response that we need is simplicity in our thinking. And, and the thought behind it then is that, that we share this breath of life. It's not going to go like we share water. We share the breath of life. I was thankful for Bobby for bringing that to us. I wanted to say that the colonial struggles are not over. We're dealing with them every day. And I wanted to say at the end of that, that if we can try and not identify with our nation states, like if we can try to put the idea that we need a nation state and all its apparatus to control us, if we can think about other ways that we can resolve the issues. You know, Fidel, years ago, uh, before the UN, sometime in the early 70s, I think, or maybe the 80s, I don't know if he was addressed and said, we have everything it takes to eradicate hunger and homelessness on this earth. And yet right now, 40 years later or something, there are people on the road, more people on the road than in their homeland. So if our responsibility then is to learn from our people, if the way we are is if our people see us and they call us by name and they know us, if our responsibility is to be in relationship to those people and understand what our work is on this earth because the earth tells us and we know that because we've been listening to it for millennia and now we don't know the language. So how do we then practice what I've just been saying about sustainability unless we agree? that we are part of this earth as human beings and have more in relationship to each other than not. And I know that sounds like the kumbaya, you know, because we have so much heading for us. But all I'm saying is the opportunity of this huge thing that hit me like a boulder on the head is the ability to speak the truth about the prejudice that made it happen. And to understand then, if I can speak about the, if I can name it and I can then address it, then perhaps, you know, we can get past it. Then perhaps, you know, we know more than we did when we started out. And so as an art maker, I think that's been my, 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 my causa, verdad? is to, is to um, as I say, um, escarbar el rostro de nuestro nuevo día. So I, I feel like, you know, everything that in my culture was fragmented and thrown into the ground, but it hasn't gone anywhere because nothing goes. We have gravity. <laughs> Whether it's ideas or things, they are there. And my task has been to figure out what comes together and what is not necessary anymore because all of it will not be replaced, but it's still there. And so I think then of myself as kind of sifting through it to find what is whole? What can I bring together? What is necessary for me to know now? Because I live in this time, not that time. And so I invite you to do that with me. This is our responsibility as art makers to, you know, scratch at the surface and see what connects. Thank you. Thank you. Wow.